This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. If you're listening for the first time, this is a sample episode as part of the Kick-Ass Politics preview station. If you like what you hear, there are more episodes to enjoy on our main podcast at Kick-Ass Politics. You can subscribe for free by going to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes or click on the link in the information page for this episode. Also, feel free to check out our website for show notes, book recommendations, and more at kickasspolitics.com. And now, I hope you enjoy this preview episode of Kick-Ass Politics. Kick-Ass Politics is brought to you by Fiverr. You've heard me rave about Fiverr before. Fiverr is the world's largest online marketplace for services with over 100 categories all offered at a fixed base price of just $5. Logo design, business consulting, marketing, business cards, stationery, web design, translation, transcription, proofreading, legal consulting, and just about any other service you can possibly imagine, all offered at a base price of just $5. And right now, when you go to kickasspolitics.com and click on the Fiverr ad on our sponsor page, you'll be showing our sponsors that you support the show, and you'll get some great offers on services tailored to your needs. Whatever you need done, find it on Fiverr. Hey there, folks. I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. A funny thing about me, when I briefly flirted with going for a business minor in college, I had to take an economics course. Like a lot of people, I didn't really understand what economics is. I assumed it was going to be very dry, with a lot of boring charts and graphs, the kind of thing that only wonky, egg-headed types could really appreciate. And yes, there were boring graphs, and my professor was indeed a wonky, egg-headed type, but... It turned out that economics is actually really, really fascinating. It isn't just about dollars and cents. It's about how societies function. And all of it is extremely applicable to daily life. If you've ever read the popular book Freakonomics, then you know what I'm talking about. Well, if you liked that one, then there's a fun new book that's a must-read. It's called Popular Economics, What the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James Can Teach You About Economics. And the author, John Tamney, is joining me on today's show. He's the editor of Real Clear Markets and the political economy editor for Forbes magazine. He says, when you think about it, everyone's an economist, and economics is just a matter of observing the world around you. He also says stimulating economic growth is in fact quite easy. Well, once you get the politicians out of the way, at least. John's going to tell you what Paris Hilton teaches us about tax policy, what we can learn from LeBron James about free trade, and much, much more. So stay tuned for John Tamney and Popular Economics in just a moment. to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. I'm happy to have John Tamney on the show today. He's the editor of Real Clear Markets, and he's an editor of Political Economics for Forbes. He has a new book out called Popular Economics, What the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James Can Teach You About Economics. John, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Ben, thanks for having me on. Well, I tell you, I like this book because I'm I'm hardly an expert on economics, but when you take away the charts and the graphs and you take it out of the classroom and just apply it to real world stuff, I find that it's one of the funnest and most interesting subjects out there. And and kudos to guys like you, um, and the economists, uh, you know, other guys like Steve Dubner and Levitt, uh, for making economics accessible. For so many people, economics is such an unknowable and almost mysterious thing. So to start off, what is one lesson that you would like for the average American to be able to understand? Well, what I would first say is that everyone's an expert on economics, and that's the point of the book, is that if you can observe the world around you, 
and you're an expert on economics. Shame on the profession for turning it into graphs and charts. There's no need to. Economics is about human action. And so, and, and why people do things. And so, if you can understand what's happening around you, you fully understand economics. And the lessons are there in sports and movies and famous businesses that, that are very, very accessible. And so, yeah, there's so much that I, that I want the book to explain to people, but probably one of the most important lessons is why do we get up and go to work every day? It's to trade. That, that's the purpose. As individuals, we are all free traders, that we go to work and we exchange the fruits of our labor for the haircuts we enjoy, the, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the apartments we live in, you name it. That's probably the most important lesson that um, an economy is about individuals. As individuals, we're all free traders. And once we understand that, we understand why taxes are so inimical to our life chances, why regulations are why bad money is, and specifically why ter tariffs on foreign goods are so bad for all Americans, because they rob us of the purpose of what we do. You spend nearly half of the book focusing on the cost of taxes to our economic prosperity. And one of the recurring themes that you bring up is the idea of, quote, the unseen. It's kind of uh, like it's a wonderful life scenario, where uh, if you could see what would have happened if all the money that's being spent in government hands hadn't been taxed away from producers and was put back into the economy and was invested in startups and research and development and so forth. But it's tough because the unseen is by definition unknowable. So how do you sell people on this idea that there's a better alternative? Well, I think the only way to sell it is to remember that Americans are 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 optimists. They believe that good things are going to happen to them. So I want to talk about the unseen and the unknowable because I want to say to people, when we reduce the size and scope of government, think of all the wonderful things that are going to take place, and they will be wonderful. Entrepreneurs cannot be entrepreneurs without capital. Bill Gates needed capital to create Microsoft. Jeff Bezos needed it for, for Amazon. Steve Jobs needed it to re revive Apple on the way to some great things. And so I want to point out to people, if government was consuming less, if John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi were allocating less in the way of the economy's resources, imagine all the entrepreneurial ventures that would get funded that aren't being funded right now. And some of these would lead, get us closer to a cancer cure, get us closer to transportation innovations that would make the airplane seem small by comparison, would get us closer to software that would make windows look dated. Let's reduce the size and scope of government because we want to unleash all the greatness within the American people. Let's talk about it positively, precisely because it would be. People love to obsess over the national debt as this economic boogeyman that's going to eventually destroy us. But you say deficits really don't matter. Well, they don't, uh, and, and they're a head fake. They put the, the, the economic debate back in the hands of big government types. Because if we obsess over deficits, we then can give them the chance to say, oh, well, let's raise taxes so that we can pay off these deficits. Well, my point is that all government spending is deficit spending. Governments have no resources. And so what we should really focus on is the size of government spending in total. If you give me a choice between an annual deficit of one, point, of one trillion on 1.1 trillion in spending or a balanced budget annually of 3.5 trillion, I'm going to take that deficit any day of the week because that signals a much smaller government. And as a result, it signals much more investment of the economy's resources into the actual private sector where it can actually do some good. And when you think about deficits more broadly, look, I'm not defending them, but again, spending is, what, is what's the problem. Um, but let's face it, rich countries can run up deficits just as Apple Computer and, and Microsoft can, can borrow money with ease in the markets. Rich countries can, can run up deficits. We can. Zimbabwe's poor. It cannot. <laughs> I like that you point out that uh, Nicaragua and Honduras have no debt, and Zimbabwe, which is one of the most failed economies in the world, uh, sometimes runs a surplus uh, because no one wants to lend to them. Absolutely. <laughs> you also say that capital gains are the jackpot that drives innovation. 
when I read that part, I thought back to the last presidential election, and uh, yeah, I think it was one of the debates. Obama was confronted with the fact that lowering capital gains taxes historically increases revenue for the IRS, but he still didn't seem to get it or didn't seem to care. So <laughs> what do you do when you're faced with this kind of illogical and ultimately self-destructive stubbornness on the part of politicians? Well, I think, again, that was the mistake. I, I, I would agree. It's empirically true that if you cut the capital gains tax rate, it generally leads to more investment that then leads to more revenue for the IRS. I think you can make a similar case for cutting the income tax rate, that the economy grows and there's more revenue for the IRS. But why would that sell to the American people? Why not say, let's cut the capital gains rate because we want more investment in the Microsofts and Intels and Apples of the future. That's how you get people behind it. Okay, so President Obama um, is stubborn about the revenue effects of capital gains tax. You just got to talk over the head of people like that and say, there are no companies and no jobs without investment first. A lower capital gains tax would mean more investment in the job creating companies of the future. And after that, whom would you rather allocate the economy's resources? John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi or Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos? I think we know the answer. Let's start talking about the good that will come if we remove the government burden. You present in your book uh, an interesting choice. On the one hand, you have the choice of investing America's dollars in a system that has some kind of an accountability where bad businesses and bad ventures are allowed to fail and successful businesses prosper and lead to jobs and so forth. Or you can trust the government and trust John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi to invest that money. And in the government side, you have no checks and balances. Whether a venture fails or succeeds, it's treated exactly the same. Absolutely. No, you put it very well, and that's the point. Even Jeff Bezos, even Warren Buffett, if they were investing as Senators Buffett and Bezos, would be tragically bad investors. And you mm -hmm. hit on why that's true. When government invests, there's no endpoint. There's no market discipline saying, okay, this isn't working. We're going to starve it. We're going to shut it down. We're not going to throw any more good capital after bad. We're going to move on. Bad ideas never die when they're funded by government. They last forever. Think about uh, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, among many, many other things. Compare that with the private sector. Why is Silicon Valley the richest part of the U.S. and the richest part of the world? It is not because of all, all of its businesses succeed. The reality is the vast majority of Silicon Valley businesses fail. But through failure, you get perfection. Entrepreneurs learn what not to do. You replace bad managers with good managers. Uh, you basically starve web vans so that you can uh, uh, get seed capital to Google and Facebook. That's the beauty of the private sector is we let our bad ideas die on the way to better ones. And that's why it's so important to leave as much capital as possible in the private the sector. Well, yeah, there's a lot to be said for quitting and moving on, and uh, government doesn't know how to do that. Amtrak, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know. think about that and imagine what private market uh, disciplined investors could do with things like a Amtrak, with the post office, you name it. I suppose the nice thing about having the post office is it's a reminder to Americans just what a lousy job government does when it's the service provider. Whereas in the private sector, lousy service providers go out of business very quickly and are replaced by better ones. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, you know, Keynesians tend to believe that spending and rampant consumption is the cure for whatever ails the economy. And they present those who save as withholding their money. Uh, as if it's being stored in a mattress somewhere or something. You say that they're looking at it entirely the wrong way. Explain what you mean by that. Oh, absolutely. Well, the, one of the examples I use, of course, in the book is Paris Hilton. Uh, she earns millions a year, and she has the potential to inherit millions more. Well, what happens with that? She, she, she can't spend it all in one place, so if she puts it in the bank – Banks aren't paying her for her deposits so they can stare lovingly at Paris Hilton's dollars. They immediately lend out Paris Hilton's money to someone not nearly as rich as she is but who need a car loan or need tuition for their kids or need a small business loan. 
if she wants to be more aggressive with it and she puts it in the stock market, Paris Hilton's massive wealth is being redistributed to companies that need it, uh, for, need a capital infusion in order to grow and prosper and add more jobs. If she puts it into a private equity or venture capital fund, her wealth is being redistributed to businesses that are on the deathbed that need a capital infusion or the next Microsoft or Intel. So when you think about it, to save is not to not consume or not invest. It's merely to shift one's wealth to those who need access to it, either to consume it or to create the next great company. Right. Consumption versus saving is essentially the choice between creating something and uh, just throwing your money into something entirely disposable, really. Um, yeah, well, and, and one thing to add to that is there's a great quote from a book that you're no doubt familiar with called um, Economics in One Lesson. Hmm. And in it, Henry Hazlitt made the beautiful point, what is harmful or disastrous to an individual must be equally harmful or disastrous to the collection of individuals that make up a nation. And his point was that an economy is not a blob, it's just a collection of individuals. Well, Keynesians say we must spend, we must consume to help the economy. Well, when you break it down to an individual, are we individuals made better off when we spend every dime of our paycheck? No, we're much worse off. We're not building wealth for ourselves, and we're a job loss away from being reliant on others, from potentially going on the dole. So the economy, by definition, is not made better off when everyone consumes with abandon. Let's face it, we have computers, we have phones, we have amazing cars and airplanes precisely because people save. There aren't entrepreneurs without savings. And that's true. And along with saving being kind of a dirty word among Keynesians, the other thing that recently has gotten a lot of traction over the past few years is the left with this whole concept of the 99% and wealth inequality as if we're you know back in, uh, in the pre-french revolution times or something and people are starving in the streets um you say that wealth inequality should not be a dirty word no i say that wealth inequality is beautiful um think about what rising wealth inequality signals it signals the happy process whereby the lifestyle gap between the rich and poor is is, is shrunken um, how do people get rich in a capitalist society? They get that way by taking the baubles formerly only enjoyed by the rich and making them broadly available to everyone. Um, if you want to see how we're all going to live in the future, and in the not-so-distant future, really all you have to do is look at how the rich live today, and history proves that. The first cell phone was created by Motorola in 1983. It was brick-sized and had a half-hour battery life, terrible reception. It cost you a fortune if you wanted to call from Chicago to uh, Detroit. Well, nowadays, um, there are billionaires around, and they got that way precisely because they made the cell phone that used to cost $4,000. They made it available for almost nothing, um, and, and with phones that we can fit in our pocket that have computers on them where we can call not just around the U.S., but around the world. The first computer was created by IBM in the 1960s. It filled a room that had very few capabilities. It cost over a million dollars. Nowadays, we can buy computers for next to nothing. Michael Dell is worth billions because he made computers broadly available to us. Henry Ford took the car, the automobile that used to only be owned by the 1%. He got rich precisely because he made it broadly available to, to us. And so that's what income inequality is. It doesn't cause poverty. It's what reduces the sting, the, the burden of poverty by making goods formerly enjoyed by the rich available to everyone. Yeah, well, you're right. You don't see businesses out there trying to make goods and services more expensive. I mean, of course not. That's that's no recipe for success. Yeah. No, um, it's, whether it's yeah. Apple or Amazon, I mean, they're constantly trying to streamline and innovate to reach the widest possible market. Um, and I love that one of the things you mentioned in there is, uh, you know, the Forbes 400 is comprised of people who made their fortune improving people's lives. So true. Uh, Patrick Soon Xiang is one of the people I feature in the book. He is worth billions today, and he is because he's brought us closer to a cure for cancer. We constantly hear from economists and politicians, they offer these evidence-free assertions that inequality is bad for society that's going to tear, us, tear it apart. Well, so listeners need to only ask themselves the question, what if Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs and Michael Dell had been layabouts? Certainly inequality would be much less, but would anyone want to live in a society without talented people like that? If someone does come up with a cure for cancer, 
and they earn billions for having done so, well, Americans actually feel that, no, they probably should have buried that cure under, underground because the inequality that would result from someone doing that would be so bad for society. And it goes back to the important Hazlitt point about how an economy is a collection of individuals. Are we as individuals worse off when we get to pursue that which most animates our individual talents, that's that which makes us most unequal relative to our peers? Obviously not. We're much better off. Imagine a world in which we're forced to do things that we're not very good at. It would be a lot more equal than it would be a terrible world to live in. Yeah, there's always room for more in the 1%. It's not an exclusive club. All you have to do is succeed. Yeah, all you have to do is innovate. Um, the, the team picture changes every year, and the one percenter club is open to those who innovate, and specifically open to those who will take what is only being enjoyed by the rich right now and making it broadly available to all people. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back to talk more with John Tamney. Hi, folks. If you're enjoying my chat with John Tamney, then I think you'd enjoy his fun and fascinating new book, Popular Economics, What the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James Can Teach You About Economics. And right now, you can download the audio version of Popular Economics for free with a special promotion for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics for a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download, which can be Popular Economics by my guest today, John Tamney, or any of Audible's 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, iPad, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the Audible ad on our website and go get your free audio book. If you like kick-ass politics and want to help keep us on the air, then please support the show by making a donation to our GoFundMe campaign at GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or go to the show website and click on the donate link. Your support will help keep us producing new and even more interesting programs in the future. That's GoFundMe dot com backslash kick ass politics. And now more with John Tamney and popular economics. We're back and I'm joined by John Tamney, author of Popular Economics, what the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James can teach you about economics. Uh John, you have a lot to say about regulation. You are not a fan of it. Um, and you say a lot of the problem with antitrust regulators is that they try to predict the future. How so? Yeah, well, that's the fatal conceit of regulation is that they presume they can the regulators that they can see into the future in the way that leaders in business would never think they could. And so I use various examples from the entertainment field to show the absurdity of it. Um, let's face it, when Monday Night Football was rolled out in the 1960s, the father of television at the time, the best television executive in the world, William Paley, dismissed it, rejected it, because he said no one would want to watch pro football on a Monday night. <laughs> the, the Sopranos, it was rejected by ABC, CBS, and right. NBC, but picked up by HBO. Well, HBO, guess what? It had the chance for Breaking Bad, but it turned that down. What this tells us is even the best minds in business get things wrong all the time. So the idea that regulators can see in the future is not a serious presumption. So you're saying that regulators are not the best minds in their field? <laughs> well, yeah, when you're talking about regulators, let's be honest. You're talking about the people who could not get jobs in the industries they presume to regulate. The Wolf of Wall Street was interesting in that the person chasing Leonardo DiCaprio's character, at one point they're having a conversation, and he admits that he couldn't pass the Series 7, and that's why he wasn't in the brokerage business to begin with. That's why he was regulating it. So we're talking about people so unskilled that they couldn't even get jobs in the industries they're trying to oversee. Let's face it, those in these businesses know that their failure rate is not very good. Why would we think someone who would have a job as a regulator could see the future with any kind of clarity? It's, it's laughable. If they had any skills, they wouldn't be regulators in the first place. They're so far behind the curve, and economies and business and innovation moves very quickly. Um, so I, I have to imagine that it would be very hard for them to predict these things. 
in particular, I think of uh, the cable industry. Just uh, you know, a couple years ago, everyone was saying we needed to regulate the cable industry because there's no competition and people being forced into these bundles and so forth. But as you correctly point out, markets generally take care of these things on their own. And sure enough, Netflix came about and Roku. And uh, you know, just within the past few months now, HBO, they have enough great content that they said, okay, well, we can confidently offer a direct subscription service. And now the other networks are following suit and it's kind Absolutely. of taking care of itself. Yep. And no, what she describes is exactly what's happened there. And what that's telling us is that markets, they see the high cost of a cable TV subscription and they're figuring out ways to deliver it to basically undercut those prices. High prices in a, in a market economy are ephemeral in nature because they attract imitators and people who, who figure out a way to bring product to people at a lower price. It's a beautiful thing. Well, one thing that's been in the headlines a lot that's a major part of your book is uh, the argument in favor of free trade. And for all those people who are afraid of losing jobs, you use uh, LeBron James as an excellent example of comparative advantage and how that applies with free trade. He is the best basketball player on earth. But interesting about LeBron James is that he's also, if he wanted to be, he could be a pretty good NFL tight end. But of course, if he played in the NFL, it would be at the expense of being the best basketball player on earth. And so we need to think about LeBron and apply it to our lives. There's lots of things that we could probably do. Some of us probably could raise our own food. Some of us probably could, if we wanted to, build the house we live in, uh, maybe sew the clothes that we wear. But if we did those things, it would be at the expense of far more productive work. And so the beauty of free trade isn't just that the world is competing to serve our needs, but it maximizes the possibility that we individuals get to do the work that most animates our talent. We can focus on the area that mo makes us most productive and then import the shoes we wear, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the apartments we live in from people across the street and around the world. It leads to maximum productivity, and that's a good life. Well, then I'm assuming that you're probably not a fan of the whole farm-to-table, locally grown food movement in, in culinary circles these days. <laughs> well, yeah, it's interesting that you ask. You know, it's um, w what a sign that we're a very rich country that we can care about something so silly. Yeah. Now, if people want that. Hey, that's good for them. If people want to pay extra for food that's probably less healthy, from what I heard, be my guest. But wow, we're a rich country that we can care about that. And other countries, they're just excited to eat. <laughs> yeah, and you know, uh, you you also say that we're 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 a pretty lucky country in the sense that we really don't need to be worrying about energy independence. You say it's unproductive for the U.S. to focus too much manpower on that as a priority. Yeah, well, no one needs to worry about energy independence. Why would they? Let's face it, oil is globally produced. It will reach those the consumers who need it at the, at the market price no matter what. There's no such thing as embargoes in a, in a globalized market economy. Um, uh, every oil-producing nation on earth could embargo the U.S. tomorrow from its oil, and we would still consume that same oil as though it bubbled up in West Texas. We would just buy the oil from those these countries are selling to. And so you think about it, the profit margins in oil are relatively low. Is New York City poor because it doesn't produce the oil that it consumes? Is, uh, you know, is Paris poor? Is, 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 is Switzerland one of the richest countries on earth and more impoverished because there's no oil in Switzerland? Obviously not. We produce in order to consume. Our work product is what allows us to import. And so rich countries import oil just like they're doing anything else. The reality is that profit margins in oil are very low relative to software, re relative to electronics, relative to lots of things that we can do in the U.S. economy. So in a normal free market, we'd probably import all of our oil, and we'd be a richer country for doing so. Yeah. We'll let others do the low-value work. We'll do the high-value work. Uh, President Obama is pushing a new trade bill, and it's odd because he has the support from the majority of Republicans in Congress, but not from his own party. And among the public, there's a lot of skepticism, and no one's seen what's in the agreement. Does it bother you that we don't know what's in the agreement? And, and if not, what would you say to those who are concerned about this trade agreement that they're trying to pass? I think with this one, 
what's got to be remembered, President Obama, his presidency for all intents and purposes ended at the end of 2012. He's been a lame duck all this time. The only way he can get legislation passed at this point is if he does something that pleases the Republicans. Now, are Republicans perfect? No, they're not. But I think to me that's a fairly good sign that this is generally a bill that's not terribly objectionable. Beyond that, I want legislation like this because I want I like the symbolism of the US being seen as open to foreign trade around the world. I think that is important. I like the idea of something that maybe makes makes it more possible for all Americans to be to have the world compete to serve their needs. People say that India will one day be the service hub of the world, uh, China the manufacturing hub, perhaps Brazil as the agricultural hub. And you know, in the, if you scale it down to the size of a company, essentially when we start farming out, as you say, those uh, less desirable jobs, it inevitably leads to the U.S. becoming uh, the management and the, the tech hub of this global company that, that we're sort of creating. Oh, absolutely. Let's face it. We used to be a farming economy. I know that if we were still that way today, I would be pathetic with a backhoe. <laughs> it used to be that we were a manufacturing economy. Are we in bread lines today because most Americans don't work in factories anymore? Obviously not. Face it, manufacturing jobs pay the equivalent of what would buy an American a Starbucks latte each day. Thank goodness we pushed manufacturing jobs overseas. They don't pay very well. And so you look at cities like New York and Los Angeles, they used to be manufacturing hubs. Uh, Google, Google's offices in New York City are in the old Nabisco factory. That's why New York is so rich. It said, oh, gosh, manufacturing, that's yesterday. We're going to keep evolving. And so manufacturing doesn't exist in New York City anymore. You want to know where it exists? It exists in places like Detroit and Flint, Michigan, very poor cities. Yeah. Why are we surprised by that? It's the cities that are willing to evolve. Let's face it, economic pros uh, progress is all about destroying former forms of work. Thank goodness we don't have to work in factories on farms anymore. We get to do more and better, more productive things all the time. New York is a monument to what happens when you evolve with the economy and let progress take hold. Detroit is a monument to what happens when you cling to the past. Well, if you have a problem with Detroit and clinging to the past, another thing that you have a problem with is the fact that the U.S. dollar hasn't really been tied to anything anymore since 1971 when we left the gold standard. So, John, make the case for the U.S. going back to the gold standard. Well, it's really very simple. The sole purpose of money is to facilitate the exchange of consumable goods. Money is not wealth. Money is what we use to exchange wealth. That's why it was created. And so the only good money is money that's very stable in value. Gold is – I'm for a return to the gold standard just because so far it's the most stable commodity we've come up with to define the dollar as. If someone can come up with a commodity that's even more stable, I will jump on that and say we shouldn't go back to gold. But for now – Markets happen upon gold as the best way to keep the value of the dollar stable, and that's the only purpose of a currency, to be a stable measure that facilitates exchange of wealth between producers. Before we go, one of the things that you bring up is you say that anyone who predicted the financial crisis is lying. Now, we had a lot of Monday morning quarterbacks out there, so what do you mean when you say that they're lying if they say that they predicted the financial crisis a few years ago? Well, they're lying because the only way you could predict the financial crisis is if you said, okay, Bear Stearns is going to nearly go out of business, and then the government, federal government is going to come in and bail it out, and it's going to then create an assumption in the marketplace that all banks are too big to fail, such that when Lehman is actually allowed to go under, the, the markets are surprised by that, and there's a panic in the marketplace. You then have to predict the Bush administration having created a financial panic would pour gasoline on the fire and ban short selling of 900 different financial stocks. You then have to predict the bailout of all sorts of other banks that, that created uh, the, the scary process and the, the uh, thought process in the marketplace that government was going to have much greater control over the economy overall. The crisis was man-made. It was a creation of government policies once banks did what they were supposed to do, which was start failing. And so everyone says they predicted a decline in housing prices. 
or a correction there. Fine, but that didn't cause the financial crisis. That was healthy. Some will say, well, you know, I predicted the failure of a few banks. Again, that's something very healthy for the economy. Silicon Valley is rich precisely because the vast majority of its businesses fail. If to, to have predicted the financial crisis, you would have had to predict all sorts of intervention by the government getting in the way of what was a healthy market correction. No one predicted that, hence no one predicted the financial crisis. If they say they did, they're lying. <laughs> Well, John Tamney, thanks so much for joining me. The book is Popular Economics, What the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James Can Teach You About Economics. It's a great read. Uh, It's got a lot of interesting good stuff in there, a lot of great examples, and it does make economics fun. So uh, thanks for uh, making economics palatable to uh, us uh, Joe Blows out here. Well, thank you very much, Ben. I really appreciate you having me on. These these were great questions. And let's remember, as human beings, we're all experts on economics. If we can observe the world around us, we are economic experts. That's the point of this book is that we all understand this stuff intimately. Shame on the economics profession for making opaque what is very easy. I think there's a lot of power for everyone in that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. Well, that's the show, folks. Thanks again to John Tamney. And if you enjoyed our chat, then I highly recommend his book, Popular Economics. It's a really fun and interesting read. I'll post an Amazon link for Popular Economics in the show notes at kickasspolitics.com. But if you'd like to get the audio version of Popular Economics totally free, audible.com is offering a special deal just for our listeners. Go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics for a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download, which can be Popular Economics by my guest today, John Tamney, or any of Audible's 180,000 titles. That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage for your free audiobook. If this is your first time listening and you enjoyed this preview episode, then please subscribe to the main podcast at Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes, or you can click on the link on the information page for this episode. I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you can automatically get new episodes as they become available. And while you're there, I'd appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps a lot with the show's rankings on iTunes. And if you like Kick-Ass Politics and want to help keep us on the air, then please support the show by making a donation to our GoFundMe campaign at GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or go to the show website and click on the donate link. Your support will help keep the lights on over here and will be greatly appreciated. That's GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. Kick-Ass Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.